Hello and welcome back to our series on designing and building accessible websites. In this video, we're going to be looking at interactions. In our previous videos, we've covered an overview of accessibility. We've then looked at fonts. And in our most recent video, we explored layout and contrast. In this video, we're going to be looking at interactions. So what do we mean by interactions? Well, in this video, we're going to break down two types. The first set of interactions we're going to look at are those that have been designed in a visual sense by the designer. The second set of interactions are more code-based interactions that are used to ensure a user has as much control of the content they wish to consume. In our opinion, interactions need to be as intuitive as possible and provide an experience that enhances usability. These interactions might use icons or symbols to help. However, this type of language should not rely on culturally based knowledge because you could be narrowing down your audience. So what does this mean? Well, if we think about the very beginning of computers and their operating systems, operating systems were effectively mimics of the office. We had the trash basket, we had folders and files, and we had and still have the desktop. This language has all come from existing Western cultural knowledge. But if we fast forward 20 years, the origin of some of these icons and symbols is less well known. In a recent Google research project, they were exploring their user interface and asked users what some of the icons they were using represented. Users came up with some interesting responses to this icon that you can see on the screen now. The response was interesting as a large group of people thought the icon represented a sun. The icon had become detached from the origin of the mechanical cog representing the settings. So the takeaway from this, while there's always going to be a balance between text and icons, we have to try and reduce our reliance on one type of language. If in doubt, then text is likely your safer option. And when we're thinking more specifically about accessibility, providing text is even more beneficial due to the added context it brings. If we think of the mobile phone hamburger symbol compared to the word menu, which is the more accessible? I would probably say the most obvious hint of interactions on a website is underlined text. The language has established itself right from the very beginning of website design. But even this can be made more or less accessible. We have two blocks of content on the screen. One has a paragraph of text and then a button that says read more. Then the same paragraph of text has a different button below saying to read more about our products. While this link is not as snappy as the previous, by including more text into the link, users who might be using a screen reader, for example, can understand context much easier. As sites grew in complexity, there became a need to explore how some links might become shown to be more important for users progressing through a site. This thinking led to the development of buttons. And in terms of buttons, they've probably become one of the most important aspects of design when it comes to people committing to an interaction, such as purchasing a product. But again, as with the underlying links, there are a few design considerations to think about in terms of accessibility and also in terms of the hierarchy on a page. One of the things to consider is maintaining contrast. In the example we have on the screen, you'll see a teaser for a theater show and we have two buttons on that teaser. Now the objective of these teasers is to do two things. First, it's to get people to buy a ticket. Secondly, it's to create intrigue and interest. So the primary button says book now for Hamilton and is the strongest, most obvious button. It is the one that is reversed out against the background color. The second button, the one which says more information for Hamilton is for those people that still need a bit of persuading. It's the secondary option. I do hope you're enjoying the video. If you are, do give us a thumbs up. And if you're enjoying the series, do consider subscribing. It really helps us out. Another common element used within the sites are image carousels. These are often neglected when it comes to providing accessible interactions. Now we said earlier that accessibility is all about control, which means it's about being able to experience content in the manner and time a user wants. 
So if we have a carousel that automatically goes from one image to another without controls, then we're not providing the user with the ability to control the time they want to consume that content. Most sites will be built to ensure users can use screen readers as well as mouse and keyboard to consume the content on that site. So you can imagine this change in navigation brings up challenges if you now don't have a pointer on the screen. The most common way will be by tabbing through the main areas of the site. But when tabbing through a site, we need to make users aware of what they're actually selecting. Now, many sites will already have existing hover states, which work when a mouse rolls over that piece of content. Often there are hover states on everything. And if there are, then they're not as obvious. So we need to ensure site content is highlighted through something called focus points. These are in effect borders which are drawn around buttons to show what's being highlighted and selected. Now, when a site is built correctly, it should be possible to tab through all of the links on a page, including dropdowns. Sometimes what you might have found is that when you're tabbing through a site, you'll see boxes around some links, then these boxes will disappear and then they will come back. Often what's happening here is the site in question is likely got a sub menu and the site hasn't been correctly built. So those links are being selected, but not shown. And remember, if we think back to our first video in this series, to make something accessible, we need it to be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. So if we can't see the links, then it falls down on this first element of poor. Another aspect of navigation is when interacting with forms and fields. Forms need to be built to allow someone to bump through the fields using tab. We've seen a number of times when a form has been altered over and over again and reordered, but the build is still in the original order. So when tabbing through the form, we jump from one field to another. And don't forget, it isn't one thing or another. Users might use a combination of keyboard and mouse. I, for example, regularly fill in a form using tab and then go back to the mouse and then return to the keyboard to scroll up and down the page. Again, if there is one thing to put out there, when designing and building sites, try and give your users choices to consume the content in the way that they want. So in summary, think about the icons you use. If in doubt, consider using text. Contextualize your links as much as possible and work to ensure your content can be consumed and controlled as easily as possible. Thanks again for watching. And as always, was there anything we missed? What things have you been considering when it comes to accessibility? Do let us know in the comments below and see you in the next video.